Hi, everyone. Um, let's welcome Dr. Karen McCluskey. She's the head of lead discovery and translational biology, supporting programs within biotherapeutics at Codexis. Um, I guess you're in Redwood City, right? Or are you in some Yeah, that's place? right. All right, this is uh, uh, my neighbor almost. She received her PhD from Imperial College London and has more than 15 years of experience in drug discovery, both with small molecules as well as with protein therapies. Dr. McCluskey <clears throat> has held positions at companies of all sizes in biotech and pharma and has authored 19 publications in a variety of disease areas, including respiratory diseases and gastrointestinal disorders. So Karen, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Dr. Das. And thank you also to um, Precision Global, Sam and Sherry, for inviting me to come and speak today on a passion of mine, which is translational biology. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a departure, I think, from some of your uh, what you've seen previously this morning, but hopefully it's of interest. And so, as, uh, as Dr. Das said, uh, I have been working in drug discovery for a number of years now and at companies of all shapes and sizes with both small and large molecules. And what I wanted to do today was really just touch on some of the challenges that I've seen over, over time and use some examples to actually show um, where you can you know, at least generate confidence uh, in, in translational success. So uh, the, the diagram or the little picture on the right hand side is one of my favourites uh, because it really does highlight something that is a huge challenge in, in drug discovery pharmacology and that's the difference between species. And that may be between a mouse and a rat, it may be between a rat and a monkey or a mini pig, but it is nonetheless uh, a problem and translatability between these species uh, can, can be almost negligible. And I don't want to focus on all of the items that are in this list, but really just to focus on the two highlighted here in green uh, and what I'll be talking about today. So the translation of data from animals to humans and also target engagement, which kind of goes hand in hand with that translational aspect. And I also wanted to just point out that we do use rodent disease models in many of our drug discovery programs, but in a lot of cases, they're actually being used to prove the mechanism of action of the particular drug discovery area and the target. And they may also, in the case certainly where I am right now, in a lot of rare diseases, be very useful to get orphan drug designation and obviously fast track um, clinical programs. But that doesn't mean that you don't still need additional in vivo, in vitro or ex vivo pharmacodynamic models where you're able to actually look at target engagement and therefore translatability within your programs. So my first example is uh, some work from way back in 2004 uh, at Maria Belvisi's lab at Imperial College. Uh, she was actually my manager at my previous company as well at that time and we kind of all moved together. Um, but this a uh, particular um, investigation was to look at nitric oxide as a non-invasive biomarker uh, in one of our models of airway inflammation, our rodent models of airway inflammation. And so this diagram, I'm not going to go into in detail. It really is just to highlight that, you know, in a disease such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you know, where you uh, may have uh, generated pathology in response to a cigarette smoke stimulus. There are many, many, many aspects going on in that situation. It's a very, very complex disease process. There are a lot of cytokines involved, a lot of inflammatory mediators, a lot of cell types involved. And I really want to draw attention to um, the fact that in multiple parts of the pathway, we actually see generation of react reactive oxygen species. And that includes nitric oxide in this case. So it is a hallmark of, of disease, of airway disease in general. And then I wanted to just show uh, an example, you know, of why we care about this. Why do we care about whether we could measure exhaled nitric oxide? And the reason is that for many years, uh, for decades, it has been measured clinically in patients that have airway inflammation as a non-invasive biomarker. 
And I really just highlighted this um, machinery to show that, you know, in 2006, people were very excited about the move away from, you know, a static machine that you had to blow into versus a handheld device that was actually just as sensitive and obviously much easier to deal with. So the question for us at that time was really, well, if we have a rodent model of airway inflammation, can we actually measure exhaled nitric oxide in that system? And this is a quite simple set of diagrams, really just to show what we were doing in the lab at the time. And so we were working with what was then Buxco anyway to do uh, force manoeuvres uh, in uh, whole body plasmography chambers. And so we thought we could maybe adapt that system to actually look at exhaled nitric oxide. And so we set up a system where we could essentially purge the nitric oxide from the chamber, allow a period of time for the animal to breathe nitric oxide out, and then essentially take a sample and measure in parts per million or parts per billion how much nitric oxide was there. And hopefully it would work. And what we actually saw was was very successful. Uh, we were able to use our lipopolysaccharide challenge from E. coli, uh, this aerosolized challenge in a chamber, to um, look at increasing doses of LPS and demonstrate a nice dose-dependent increase in exhaled dino produced, which is the left-hand side top graph, compared uh, at, or correlating with uh, a, an increase in INOS gene expression as well, which was very comparable. And um, having chosen a submaximal concentration, we were able to go into a time course to demonstrate that a six hour time point would work very well for assessment in our model. I haven't shown it here, but we did see all of the other increases you would expect to see in inflammatory cells such as neutrophils and cytokines across the board and then also uh, enzymes that are involved with, um, with neutrophils, um, uh, such as neutrophil uh, peroxidase. So the question really was, could we now use this model, this uh, apparent system that we'd set up and look to inhibit using specific small molecule agents? And the answer to that in, in, in sort of short shrift was yes. Um, we were able to use uh, L-name, which is a non-selective NOS inhibitor, uh, and compare that to 1400W, a, a fairly selective INOS or inducible NOS inhibitor, and show that in this model, uh, where we actually have a significant increase in the exhaled NO following an LPS challenge, a dose-dependent reduction in the amount of exhaled NO uh, uh, which was, um, you know, very nicely uh, reproduced between the two molecules in this case. And we were able to correlate that with an inhibition of neutrophilic inflammation. These are neutrophil numbers in the lung tissue. And as you can see, 1400W outperforms just slightly, but we do have a very similar response. And importantly, we're not seeing an inhibition of the INOS mRNA. Um, in the system, which is expected because these inhibitors are inhibiting function, they're not inhibiting transcription. So all in all, this is a, a nice set of data, I think, that shows that, you know, exhaled NO can be used in place of more invasive um, biomarker measurements. Um, we're able, in, in this case, to actually not euthanize animals. We could keep them going on chronic studies. And more importantly, it really does seem to be a good indicator of disease severity and, uh, and give us an ability to actually look at utility of therapies within a model that capitulates some of the um, pathologies of, of a disease like COPD. So kind of switching gears again completely, um, uh, at, in my time at Theravance Biopharma, uh, we, worked, we worked on a lot of JAK inhibitor programs, they still do, uh, and one of the, the programs that my team was kind of intimately involved with was looking at our pan-JAK inhibitors and in mouse models of IBD and doing further characterization of our gut selective inhibitor, which had actually made it into clinic at this point. And so I'll give you some of the background and also just some of the cool stuff uh, that we were able to do um, while the molecule was in early clinic. So I don't really want to go into the nuts and bolts of uh, intestinal inflammation. Uh, I think most of us, if not all of us, know that uh, 
inflammation of the GI tract is awful. Um, that picture on the right hand side doesn't doesn't need any explanation. And, you know, whether it be, you know, diseases that are IBD related or more GI like celiac, they are very nasty. Um, they're not rare diseases. They're hugely prevalent, but they still have a clear unmet medical need. And they have a lot of therapies available, but most of those therapies either don't work very well or only work for a certain period of time. And some of those therapies have their own uh, pathologies associated. So I don't want to focus uh, too much on this uh, diagram at all. This is really just to represent that uh, within the JAK-STAT pathway, there are uh, multiple cytokines involved. There are multiple JAK um, pairings uh, that you can uh, that you can impact, and also that we can use. Uh, more, most importantly, phosphorylated stats really is a measure of target engagement within these models and within our pharmacodynamic readouts, within our colon biopsies, etc. And um, you know, it was already well established that systemic panjak inhibition uh, was clinically validated. Uh, tofacitinib uh, was one of the first um, molecules out there, having previously been approved for RA, uh, was, was then approved for UC. Uh, and, and just to kind of speak to that, you know, yes, tofacitinib works, but tofacitinib has issues, right? And we all know those very clearly as well. I think uh, if we have enough uh, social media these days that we're all aware of when something gets a black box warning and, you know, tofacitinib has a black box warning because of systemic toxicities. So in looking at um, the proof of concept, and I'm actually just going to go all the way through this, um, the, the idea was to basically take something like tofacitinib and compare its normal delivery route, which is, you know, oral and therefore systemic, uh, to uh, a, a delivery route where we could actually determine exactly where the compound was being administered. So in this case, it was intrathecally, so direct to the site of action. And what we were able to do in an oxazolone colitis model, uh, where we measured disease activity, which is a combination of stool blood and stool consistency, was demonstrate that you know, there was really comparable efficacy in that model, uh, regardless of route. And what we also showed with this data, and I apologise that the, the grey bars are very light grey, um, but hopefully you can see that with tofacitinib given by a systemic route, you get very similar plasma and colon concentrations. But when you give it via the local route, you can actually start to dissect uh, the, the, two, the two areas, the two compartments. So, you know, proving the concept um, and then also, you know, with a, with a view to, you know, what did the PK look like of our uh, lead molecule in healthy rats? You can see here that on the left hand side, there's hardly any therapeutic index between the plasma and the colon versus, you know, this greater than 20,000 um, selectivity index uh, uh, for, um, for the PANJAC inhibitor. This is the... the local panjac inhibitor, excuse me. We also looked at this molecule in our oxazolone model again, and on the left-hand side here, you can see it compares very well to tofacitinib, so the activity is definitely there. Um, and then looking at splenic natural killer cell counts, which is an indicator of immunosuppression, we can see that really the local molecule had uh, essentially no impact on, on these particular cells. And so that was, um, again, very uh, confidence boosting that the, the, the target, the, the, um, the paradigm uh, was working out the way that we wanted it to. So I mentioned the Soxazolone model, um, and I also mentioned, you know, you can look at target engagement um, some early data that we had, we actually used Im immunohistochemistry to say, yes, phosphorylated stats are found in the colon. And really, uh, around about the time that we were really looking at trying to assess quantitatively um, how we could measure this, uh, Nanostring actually started demoing their uh, digital spatial profiling instrument. And that's the instrument that's 
showing in the lower right hand side of at least my screen. Um, and I'm not going to go into that, but basically uh, I think everyone in the lab referred to it as IHC on steroids. So basically you can get your single, you know, tissue slice, your IHC prep, and then we can look at up to 40 different markers, whether they be cellular markers or actual biomarkers, uh, and measure all of those quantitatively on a per cell basis. So really quite a powerful tool and something that we were very excited to, to, to profile more. And so we did this with both the um, with tofacitinib as well as with our um, gut restricted inhibitor. And hopefully you can see this nicely, even if you have a very small screen, but um, this really highlights that TD 1473 was able to reduce this T cell inflammation that you can see in red from the vehicle treated group on the left hand side. Uh, those T cells are, are essentially, they're present in the large part in the mucosa, but they're also present in the epithelium and the lamina propria. Um, JAGs are present on um, uh, T cells within all of these areas. And what you can see with treatment is, uh, hopefully, uh, if you can see the same I do, uh, almost a complete obliteration of, of T cell inflammation in this model. So this was obviously, you know, a really nice visual. Um, but, you know, how did we look at, how did it look when we actually measured PSTAT3 inhibition? And so in uh, two time points that we set in this model, what we were able to show uh, was a significant inhibition of the translational biomarker, uh, one we can can use and do use in the clinic, in all cell types that actually have uh, JAK expression. So uh, really nice data, very quantitative, and importantly, also very comparable to tofacitinib. And so, you know, really giving us confidence that the approach is working and that when we get into clinic, we can measure, you know, these um, parameters and, you know, they have and the compound continues to move through clinical trials and is, is you know, very successful so far, touch wood, and hopefully, you know, we'll make it onto market in the not too distant future. So really, you know, I just wanted to highlight that this is, you know, there are many, many ways um, that we can actually give ourselves more confidence in the data that we generate from our models actually being relevant. And so I just wanted to finish, and I hope I'm not running over time. Um, I wanted to finish uh, in talking about one of the programs that, that we have um, at Codexis, so at my current company. Uh, so Codexis has a pipeline that includes uh, rare diseases, genetic diseases such as lysosomal storage disorders, which include Fabry, and also uh, GI disorders in the IBD space, uh, as well as inborn errors of amino acid metabolism. Um, so, you know, kind of a, a broad portfolio, but this is a really good example, I think, of, you know, an area where if you have the right cell types and, and, and a model in a monogenic disease, you can actually get really good translatability. And so I wanted to, to quickly just give you a, a, an introduction to Fabry disease. This is a rare disease. There are less than 200,000 patients in the US with this um, horrible disease. Uh, it was rare disease day on, on Sunday um, for those who uh, don't work in rare diseases. So we were obviously, um, uh, uh, you know, just uh, celebrating um, and, and, and talking with all of the rare disease community over the last week or so, uh, even more so than usual. Um, but back to Fabry, just quickly. So this is... Uh, a disorder where the uh, alpha galactosidose or GLA enzyme gene is missing. And so as a result, you get a buildup in the lysosome of GB3, which is the substrate. And overaccumulation will lead to a number of pathologies. But most importantly, um, if these patients are not treated, uh, they basically go through heart and kidney failure and a lot of uh, neuropathies as well. So pretty nasty. So this slide really speaks to, you know, being able to get access to the appropriate um, cell types and the success that you can get from that, uh, as the title suggests. So in this case, uh, where we were able to access fibroblasts from Fabry patients and we were able to um, get 
podocytes or kidney cells where the enzyme has been knocked out, we're actually able to have in our arsenal um, you know, cell types which are actually specific to the disease, they're specific to the organs that are being impacted by overaccumulation of that substrate when the enzyme is actually missing. And hopefully what you can also see very clearly here uh, in the blue versus the red and on the right hand side two graphs initially is that um, treatment with uh, the evolved Codexis variant resulted in a much greater um, activity uh, within these cell types than the wild type enzyme in red. And similarly, uh, a greater depletion of the substrate as a result uh, compared to the wild type enzyme. So, you know, this data is part of a set of data that gives us confidence that, you know, the enzyme will work in the relevant tissues. Uh, but what else do we know about, uh, about these molecules and how they perform? So, because we evolve enzymes uh, and proteins, quite often we don't uh, run a standard PK assay, if you like, where we're, you know, if you were looking at a small molecule, you'd measure that small molecule mass. Um, ELISA's for uh, variants that are evolved, that are, you know, mutated for better properties, no longer represent or, or um, look like the wild type, and so therefore wild type ELISA antibodies don't work. So what we can use and what may actually be more useful in this case is the actual enzyme itself um, and the activity of that enzyme as, as a, a surrogate for activity. And so what you can see here in all three cases, all three species, we actually are able to show that our, our evolution program, which in this case is trying to enhance the the, the negative or the, the lacking aspects of the wild type enzyme and serum stability and lysosomal stability, here you can see that the serum stability does seem to be much improved in a reduction in clearance uh, and obviously a longer half-life in the plasma. So again, giving us confidence that our approach is working and this is also at a clinical dose, so we expect that we would see, you know, um, a similar uh, better efficacy in the patients. And finally, if we look at the mouse disease model, there are actually a couple of Fabry models uh, in mice and rats. Uh, this one recapitulates some of the pathologies that we are interested in. And importantly, we can actually look at, again, the enzyme activity as well as the substrate concentration within a tissue or an organ of, of interest, of, of impact in the disease. And hopefully what you can see quite clearly here is that both of the Codexis variants have much better activity in the heart and at least one of our variants uh, in the single injection um, dose paradigm is outperforming the wild type for the reduction in GB3 levels as well. So this is the, the third example I have. It's again, you know, a nice, I think, story and a robust data package that provides confidence and learnings um, to move to clinic. And, and again, with uh, using a clinical dose in these particular types of models and these lysosomal storage disorders, you're, you're hopefully much more um, close to translatability as well. So I wanted to finish just quickly with um, something that has been the topic of a lot of conversation uh, in the most recent past at Codexis. I mean, something I think about pretty much on a daily basis um, but, you know, having kind of the greater or the, the larger scientific population at the company as well, thinking about translatability is important. And so uh, Whaling and his colleagues produced, uh, or, um, they wrote a, a number of papers kind of between 2008 and 2012 that were really looking at uh, the idea of not just translatability, but other success factors for drug discovery. But what I have represented here, and I'm not going to go through each individual item, is the what they refer to as their translatability scorecard. And so it's something that as we think about our programs within the company at the start of, of a possible program uh, uh, beginning, you know, if we look at a translational scorecard, does that give our does does it give us more or less confidence that we should even start that program? Right, these are going to be very useful uh, and continuing to move forward and continuing to to you know 
choose choose the right path to success, given that there are so many diseases that have unmet need. So with that, I just want to say a quick shout out and thank you to my colleagues in Maria Belvisi's lab that were uh, at Imperial College in London, uh, the pharmacology team at their events Biopharma, and everyone in biotherapeutics at Codexis. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Thank you so much, Karen, for your presentation. And Karen will be our chairperson for tomorrow, day two of our virtual summit. And uh, it was a good point that you mentioned about Rare Disease Day. It was, yeah, like you mentioned, the past uh, weekend. And uh, we also celebrated that by spreading awareness and whatnot. And uh, Dr. Dust um, and anybody else that has any questions up. Uh, I guess I'll pose, pose a question. So, Karen, this is a fabulous story. Uh, you know, along with Fabry's disease for in lysosomal storage disorders, are you also looking at anything else like pompous disease or mucolipidosis? Uh, yeah, we are looking at other lysosomal storage disorders, but we haven't disclosed necessarily um, everything that we're talking about. We actually are working on Pompa. Uh, one of my colleagues had a presentation at the World Symposium last month and, uh, you know, got a lot of you know, good, good interaction and, and interest on that. So, yeah, we, we're, wow. you know, yeah. we'll work on anything I think that makes sense. Wow, great. Well, and uh, yeah, if anybody has any other questions for Karen, um, you can let us know or we can always email it to her as well. Um, and uh, yeah, with that said, thank you so much, Karen, for your great presentation. Thanks, everyone. It was a pleasure. And um, with that said, I guess um, we will all be ending this session and then we can all go to the next room.